I'd like us to reframe the conversation around how we use our devices. Instead of using them to maximize our productivity and and packing in as much as we can in the day, I want us to think about how we can achieve well-being, get our work done, but maintain our well-being. We want to end our day in feeling positive because there's a psychological theory, it's called the broaden and build theory, that says that when people feel positive, they can do more. We have a wider set of actions that we can take. We have a better choice of things we can do. We can generate more ideas. If we're positive, we will be productive along the way. But let's put the well-being first, Mm. first and foremost, and the productivity will happen. Welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hey friends, it's Michelle Lamoureux and welcome back to the Good Life Coach Podcast. Today, you're going to be learning all about attention span or what feels more like diminishing attention span. Joining us today is Dr. Gloria Mark, Chancellor's Professor of Informatics at the University of California, Irvine. She's the author of Attention Span, a groundbreaking way to restore balance, happiness, and productivity, which presents the science of attention plus solutions for regaining focus with our personal technologies. Gloria received her PhD from Columbia University in psychology and studies the impact of digital media on people's lives, examining multitasking, interruptions, and emotions. She's appeared in popular media, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, BBC, and many others. And welcome, Gloria. I'm so grateful to have you on today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I think we all are relating to this feeling like, what's happening with my brain? Why can't I focus? I feel like my level of focus is is shifting and we don't know why, but you do. <laughs> You've been studying this. So I'd love to- Yeah, so I'd love to begin with what led you to begin a 20 plus year journey to study attention and our distraction from our devices. Yeah, so it actually comes out of my own personal experience. Um, So I had been living and working in Germany. I I was working at a research institute where uh, I basically was responsible for one project, sometimes two projects. Then I came back to the U.S. with my husband in the year 2000 and entered the world of academia. And all of a sudden, I had to deal with multiple research projects, plus teaching, writing grants, mentoring students, uh, serving on committees, doing all kinds of service work, reviewing papers. And I just found my attention, uh, you know, shifting like mad. Now, the, the the work changed, the country changed, the culture changed. Yeah. A lot of things had changed. Uh, at the same time, the digital age was just really taking off. This was the year 2000. Yes. Um, and I started to talk to other people to find out, it, is it just me? Do other people have this experience? So people in other professions as well were reporting, having trouble focusing their attention. Yeah. But there was another strange thing that was happening at the same time, which is that I I was becoming glued to my computer. It was so hard for me to break away from my computer. And yet when I was in front of my computer, my attention was shifting between different (laughs) applications and websites. And so as, as a scientist, I wanted to study empirically to what extent is this a widespread phenomenon? It, yes. Is it just me and a few people I speak to, or is it widespread? And it turns out it it is widespread. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned Germany. It was a question I was going to ask a little further on, but just let, I'm just curious, um, do we know, is is this a more American problem or is this a global issue? 
So it, it since then, it seems to have become a global issue. So, you know, back in 2000, of course, it very much had to do with the place where I worked. Yes. Uh, it, it was less of a problem. But, you know, the, the world has become much more interconnected. We're, you know, we're much more global. And so I am hearing about problems focusing from so many countries around the world and so many different kinds of workplaces as well. Yeah. You mentioned in the in the book how when you lived in Germany, you would take an hour lunch with your colleagues and then you would walk for 20 minutes. I just felt more relaxed just hearing that. And I thought <laughs> even around the time I was in the workforce in corporate, so I graduated college in 93, I never really left my desk other than to grab a sandwich and sit at my desk and eat it. So uh, I'm wondering, do you are, are some of the, at least those cultural benefits still there in those countries, do you think? Because I feel like here we're a little too hardcore about productivity and uh, we diminish the importance of actually connecting and eating and chewing our food <laughs> and connecting and then maybe moving a little bit, right? Yeah. So, so the one cultural practice that that still exists a, across much of Germany is that the main meal of the day uh is is uh, done at lunchtime okay so it's called mittagessen mid middle of the day meal and and it's usually a warm meal and it's usually a, a large meal and so it does give people the chance to spend time with each other yeah. Now, you know, I can't say that every workplace still has people, you know, going in groups out to lunch, uh, but you you still have this practice. And of course, in the U.S., uh, and I learned this very quickly in the year 2000 when I came, yeah. lunch is more of a quick takeaway, uh, you know, a sandwich, a salad, and, um, you know, sometimes you might make an appointment to eat with someone else, yes. but it's, you know, for the most part, pretty much a, a alone activity. Yeah. Which I think it, it, I feel like, and, and uh, yeah, it feels like it's a bigger issue here just with our cultural norms. Right. Um, I want to read something from your book, from the introduction, because I think people are going to relate to this. I mean, there were a couple of different examples, but you start, you open. Imagining, op imagine opening your laptop at the beginning of the day. Right away, you are faced with an onslaught of emails. You glance over them, a number of them demanding some thought, and you begin to answer them, realizing each takes quite a bit of effort. You then switch to work on a project that you have to finish today, take some phone calls, but then you receive a, no a notification of another email from your supervisor. You jump to that right away to communicate implicitly to her that you are doing your job, but then your calendar notifies you of your next Zoom meeting. It's only 10 a.m., but you are already starting to feel fatigued. By three o'clock, you can barely think about that project coming due. You start to work on it and find that you have trouble focusing and keeping making and keep making mistakes. So what is going on? What what's what's happening? Why are why is our attention span diminishing? Is this outside inf factors, internals? Like give us a, a, yes. yeah, a there's... picture of what's ha like the different things that are taking our attention away and keeping us from getting our stuff done. Yeah, there's there there's a lot to unpack. There's there's a lot going on. So the the scenario that you read is pointing out the fact that people are multitasking, switching their attention among, you know, so many different tasks and yeah. uh, and uh, devices even, um, and getting exhausted. And when we do switching like that uh, continually, it it eats up into our very precious and limited attentional resources. Yes. So so that's part of what's going on. And it also turns out that when we're exhausted, we have a harder time uh, filtering out distractions. Mm -hmm. So we're we're much more susceptible to distractions when we're tired. And so we get into the cycle of getting ourselves more and more exhausted. And of course, we're you know, being uh, our attention is switching to take care of all kinds of distractions, emails and phone calls and text chimes and Slack. And then that eats into these mental resources that we have. And then we become it becomes even harder 
to pay attention. So it's it's a, a vicious cycle that we get ourselves into. And, you know, there there is so much going on. For example, we are about as likely to self-interrupt as to be interrupted by something <laughs> external. Yes. So, you know, we we tend to blame all these notifications and ads and, you know, all these things are distracting us. But actually half the time we distract ourselves, right? It could be we have an urge to check email. We have a memory that we forgot to do something. You know, we remember we have to make a phone call. There was a task that was unfinished. We have to get back to. So all these things go on in our minds as well that uh, that pull us away from, from our work. Yeah, it's interesting because I definitely blame the tech. But when I read the part about self-interrupting and your example, I remember I was I laughed out loud because <laughs> it <laughs> felt like me. I think people can relate to that. Um, your research showed that in 2004, our attention span was two and a half minutes and is now 47 seconds. Can you delve into this a little bit? Just unpack this for us. Is that screen time? And what what does this mean? Yeah. Like, what are the implications of this? Yeah. So first of all, let me emphasize that we measured this empirically. So we we didn't ask self-reports, how long do you think you're on a screen? We we actually measured this. So back in 2004, we used to actually shadow people in their offices with stopwatches. <laughs> we, we would click yeah. stopwatches, very labor intensive. But, you know, every time someone would switch their attention, we'd click on the stopwatch. So we we had that recorded. Uh, fortunately, the invention of computer logging techniques came along. So we, you know, this was saved us a lot of labor, but we yes. could automatically and unobtrusively measure the length of time that people were on any screen before switching. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what changed? Well, social media came along, yeah. right? 2003, Facebook was invented. Uh, you know, Twitter came uh, a few years after that. In 2007, the smartphone, the iPhone was invented. So every year there have been more and more uh, uh, sources of distraction that have come along. And, yes. and of course, more devices as well. So, you know, so that's a big part of it. Now, the 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 forty we find in the last five or six years that attention averages about forty seven seconds, right? And that's an yes. average. Okay. That means you know sometimes it's higher. It also means sometimes <laughs> it's lower. If if we look at the the midpoint yes. of our observations, the very midpoint was forty seconds. And what this means is that half of all the observations show that people's attention span is 40 seconds or less, wow. right? Less than 40 seconds. So we spend so much of our time when we're on our computers and our phones, basically switching our attention around. And, you know, I, I was searching for a word to describe this. It, it was dynamic. And I came up with the word kinetic, right? Kinetic attention, because kinetic refers to, you know, jumping around and and being dynamic. And it just seemed like a really good description yes. of what was going on. So, you know, when we use our computers and phones, we're experiencing kinetic attention. And I, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. And I'll also mention that other people have replicated results in the, in the last uh, five, six years, and they find you know, 44 seconds, 50 seconds, but it's, you know, all around the same amount of time averaging 47 seconds. And are we rebounding or are we <laughs> taking time to get back on track? I mean, that's, that's real. That's not even a full minute. That's scary. It It is. Um, so I'm, I'm often asked, are we going to continue to shorten our attention yes. spans? Uh, I, you know, I'm an empiricist. I, I study, I, I want to see what the data shows. Uh, I mean, my own sense is that I don't think we can shorten our attention spans 
much more. <laughs> it's they're pretty short already. And we already have, you know, I, I almost feel like we're near saturation with the number of different websites and social media that that people can pay attention to. So I don't think they will become much shorter, but I can't say until I actually measure them. Right. And then what about getting back into our work? So is it that, for example, Gloria, I'm on an, uh, in a document, I'm writing, and then I hear a ping or even, or whatever, I self interrupt for some, whatever reason, because I thought of something else while I was looking at a word. <laughs> Do I get back into my work easily? Or is it like over the course of an hour, if, you know, every 47 seconds or 40 seconds, someone's distracted? Yeah. What's that looking like in terms of productivity and being able to re-engage? Yeah. So, um, you know, when we were looking at the data, we thought maybe it's not so bad to right. shift our attention so fast if you're working on the same project. Yeah. So if I'm writing a paper and I'm switching from, let's say, email to uh, talking on the phone with someone to reading an article and it's all the same project, maybe that's not so bad. So how often do people actually switch projects. Yes. Right. So we find that people switch projects about every 10 and a half minutes, uh, which is still <laughs> pretty short. Right. <laughs> and and remember, if you, even if you're working on a project, you're still switching around to different, different things. Yes. But if we're interrupted from a project, whether it's by ourselves or by something external to us, it takes about 25 and a half minutes to get back to that original project. Now, what are we doing in those 25 and a half minutes? We're not staring into space. Right. What we do is, on average, this is the pattern, You, yeah. we then switch to work on another project. <laughs> and then we switch to another one. And then we start to work on another one. And then we go back to the <laughs> first one. So 25 and a half minutes have gone by. We're being distracted once, twice starting a third time. So it becomes really hard to reorient back to that original project. And and we lose efficiency, right? There, mm -hmm. There's a switch cost every time we're switching attention, even when we're switching between, say, my writing an article and looking at email, even if it's related right. to the article, there's still a switch cost. The, the time and the effort that it takes to switch to something else and get back on track. Oh my gosh, this is so fascinating. Okay. Tell us what you were, you were talking in the book about different attention types that you've discovered and rhythms in our attention. Can we unpack this a bit too? Sure. So, you know, there's this, um, this narrative that there's two states of attention that were either focused or unfocused, right? The, yeah. These two states. And it's a lot more nuanced than that. Uh, so, you know, when I was studying attention, it occurred to me that sometimes people can be very engaged in something and, and very challenged. Like if I'm trying to read some difficult material, it really requires a lot of mental effort. But other times I might be watching YouTube and I'm very engaged, not at all challenged. Yes. Or when a person plays solitaire, uh, you know, can be very engaging, but not at all challenged. Yes. And so what we did was we asked people in a workplace, we we gave them these probes that they could answer within a few seconds. And we probed them throughout the day and asked them, you know, for the thing you just did at this moment, how engaged were you and how challenged were you? And we collected these observations over the course of a day. We did it for uh, multiple days for multiple people. And we find that uh, there are different attentional states. So if a person is uh, engaged and challenged, we call that a state of focus, okay. right? It's using some mental effort. If people are engaged, not at all challenged, like playing solitaire, we call that rote attention. That's the, the label we give. If you're not engaged and not challenged, it's boredom, state of boredom. And if you're challenged and not at all engaged, like when I have a tech problem, yes. right, I'm, I'm really challenged and I just cannot 
bring myself to be motivated yes. to try to figure it out. <laughs> yes. we, we, we call that frustration, right? It's yes. a frustrated kind of, of attention. The, these are labels. And we find that for focused attention, when people are engaged and challenged, we find there to be peaks throughout mm. the day. There, there are two peaks. So for most people, there's a peak around mid to late morning, like 10 to 11 a.m. for most yes. people. Yes. Then there's a second peak, about 2 to 3 p.m. And, and this coincides with the ebb and flow of our limited attentional resources that we have. Yes. Right? We, we can't have nonstop focus. We, we just can't. Yeah. And, um, and, and there is a, a, a common narrative that, you know, let's try to push ourselves. Let's be, let's do nonstop focus for hours. It, we can't do that. Right. right. Our, our, our minds get exhausted. We, we get cognitive fatigue. Yeah. I, I just read some recent research that came out that shows that there's actually a neuroscience basis for this kind of cognitive fatigue that we experience. We yeah. we just can't have long periods of extended focus without getting exhausted. Our, our brains just don't work that way. So, you know, what can we do? Well, you know, taking breaks is extremely important. We can also switch to doing this kind of rote attention where you're engaged with something and, and you're not challenged. Um, so we also find that when people do rote, use rote attention, they're actually the happiest. Hmm. They're actually happy. There, there's something calming about it, and um, you know, do it, doing things that are easy, but you're really engaged with it. So it's not a bad practice to spend some time doing rote attention. It's it's not horrible. You know, there's this thought that it's a waste of time. Never do that. It can have benefits, right? But of course, we have to be very careful. We we can't spend the entire day doing road activity, but you can limit it to a few minutes, right? Yeah. To, to kind of pull back, get yourself a little bit replenished. Yes. Um, but of course, the, the best break is to go outside in nature is absolutely the best thing we, we can do to restore our attention. Love it. Because I think you can go if is would be scrolling on Instagram, would that be a road activity? Because that's would, a ra- could be a rabbit hole of you all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, it's been an hour. Yes. <laughs> and it, <laughs> that's really bad. It's it's a it's a road activity. Uh and it also you have to be very strategic about doing it. Um in the book, I write about this idea of attention traps. And we can so easily fall into attention traps when when we're online the the yeah. social media trap is is a big one and if you're a person who's really prone to these kinds of attention traps um you, you can't just indiscriminately go on social media and expect <laughs> that it's it's going to be helpful so you know set a timer or uh, do it like if you just came out of a really difficult meeting and you've got a few minutes before your next meeting, hopefully there's a transition. Yeah, you can do some, you know, simple kind of exercise uh, just to kind of help calm yourself before you go on to your next um, your next duty. Yeah. And I like what you talked about getting outside because, you know, you talked about the importance of sleep in the book and they talk about how sitting is like the new smoking and it's so dangerous, but we're spending, what was it? Did I hear read 90% of our time or something? That's right. That's right. We, we, we tracked 750 people across the U S for a year. And, uh, we had them wear these, you know, wearable devices, which count steps. And the average amount of time was 90 percent of the time people are sedentary in the yes. workplace. Yes. So that's, you know, I like the idea of moving versus because getting up because it's better for them. And you also talked about getting that good night's sleep because in our focus, we're more refreshed, right? That's you right. You talked about that's our right. cognitive resources. What does that mean exactly? I, I had that question because you referred to it before with the, you know, our precious gas tank, as you talk about. Yes. Um, ways to recharge? Is it what you're talking about? Is this what we're talking about here? Like the sleep, get moving a little bit? It is. Road activity. Yeah. 
It is. And I, I like to use that metaphor of, you know, we have our own personal tank of attentional resources or cognitive resources. And you can think of it as our attentional capacity. And it's limited. And there's things we do that drain those that that tank. Now, yeah. if you if you have a really good quality sleep, then you start your day with a, you know, full tank or near a full tank yes. of attentional resources. Things we do throughout the day can drain that tank. Every time we switch our attention, the the tank leaks because of the switch cost that yeah. I mentioned. It 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 uses energy above and beyond the energy that we need to actually do the task. So our our tank keeps leaking and of course if you have periods of extended focus sustained focus that also uh, drains our resources. So it's so important to pull back, take a really good break, get ourselves refreshed, build those resources back up. Being outside in nature is absolutely the best thing we can do. Yes. Right? But but it's so important to to break up our day and really take these these um good breaks, really good quality breaks. Yeah. Let me ask you, because I'm just curious, why is it we can binge watch a Netflix series, right? And give our full attention to that, but we we get distracted otherwise, right? Like that might be the only time that we're actually sitting and focusing and like right. it's like, oh, this is such a good series, and the next thing you know, you've watched five. Right. What's going on there? Be, because it's engaging for us. It's it's very engaging. And, you know, you have like a good film and TV director. They're going to design a show so that it's really engaging mm -hmm. for our attention. And it's easy, right? We can we can use rote attention for lengthy periods of time because okay. we're, we're not using our cognitive resources to struggle to try to um, you know, to to make sense of it, like we do it, it we do if we're writing a paper, yes. or trying to read some difficult material. So we're in, we're enjoying it, right? And it's interesting for I us, see. right? It's we're, there's pleasure, there's pleasure, there's yes. pleasure. But you talked about how the directors are designing it in that way, and that's what's happening. But in and I think in a negative way with the social media, where where it's designed to keep you addicted to it. And then yes. there was the example you gave in the book, which made me laugh. Was it the boots that kept popping up in your <laughs> email and everywhere because the devices are also listening and then trying to sell us stuff. Um, that's right. So that's the downside of um, some of these road activities is that they are designed to keep us. And then for, the, I always worry about the younger or maybe even who knows how, well, who, who, yeah. depending on your level of resilience or your need for external validation, it could be damaging, right? Yeah, every every time we go online, we leave digital traces for all the things we do. What you know, what we like, the websites we go to. If you go to a shopping site, you know, all of this is recorded and it's sold to um, to uh, people who manage these databases. Yeah, which which in turn, uh, you know, can sell this information to um, to companies that design algorithms that can target ads. Uh, depending on what our profile is, so if I'm uh, if I'm deemed to be an introvert, there can be an ad that's designed to appeal to introverts, and I uh, might be more attracted to it. So wow. yes, our uh, our attention is monetized, and you know that's something that we have to be very aware of and and realize. And of course, one of the most basic things you can do is use ad blockers, turn off notifications. Yeah. Okay. I love this. Um, you share personally in the story that um, you, I'm just going to read this, your relationship to tech, you had a wake up call and it changed the way you engage with tech and devices. And I think this was even before your research had started. Is that correct? No, I, I had been working you had on been. this. Okay. Yeah, I had been working on this. And in the midst of all of this, I received a diagnosis of colon cancer, stage three colon cancer, which uh, just came out of the blue, wow. right? I mean, I thought I was the healthiest person that I knew, and you know, I I ate right, I exercised, kept my weight uh, down, and all of a sudden, I get this diagnosis. And um, now, I don't know 
how that happened, no one really knows. Yes. Um, my my own suspicion is that I was experiencing a lot of stress, and the stress just caught up with me. I mean, there there's some research that suggests there might be a link between uh, stress and cancer, but that's not definite. Yes. Uh, this is just my own uh, interpretation. Yes. Of what happened. But in any case, it was a wake up call for me to realize that um, I, I was experiencing just an, an inordinate amount of stress. Hmm. And I really needed to do something about that stress. And so um, this is when I started to realize that my relationship with my computer, even though I was studying it, my own relationship with it was was pretty flawed and and I could improve it. What did you do to change? I know so, you talk about, and I don't mean to interrupt, but you talk about in the book some strategies, but I'm curious how it impacted you because you study this, you've written this, and then you've done something personally. So yeah. Yeah. So what one of the first things that I did was try to curtail just the amount of time that I was on my device. Um I tried to do, you know, I I I didn't take off time from work. I continued wow. with work because, wow. well, when when you have cancer, the most important thing for you is to be normal, to have a normal life again. Yes. And so I wanted to continue with my work. The, the last thing I wanted to do was take work off and sit at home, right? So I continued working, but I um, worked in such a way that I, I tried not to overuse tech, but I, I used it to conduct my work, get my work done, and then tried to, you know, take time away from it. Um, and then I I did develop these, these strategies uh, for how I could keep myself less distracted. And, you know, and of course, this impacts my, my cognitive resources and, you know, made me feel less exhausted. Yes. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that. I, I thought that was important. And, um, you know, you've, I think the stress piece, it would be interesting to see, you know, how this plays out, but whatever we can, we know that stress impacts all levels of our areas of our health, whether it's yes. correlated with cancer or not, we still know. So anything we can do to, to reduce it is, is key. And I think you're right with the, our relationships. I, I just feel like this computer is always with me, you know, or, yeah, I remember a time, and you will too. We didn't walk around with our phones in our hands all the time. And I'm looking at kids now and teens, and they'll all be con they'll be sitting together, but they all have their devices. And so, I would love it if you could speak a little to what you're seeing because I know you you don't think that the attention span will diminish, but what do we know about? The, this next generation, I mean, they grew up with tech. To them, it's normal. We remember yes. what it was like not to have any of this. And it was, it just felt so much better, in my opinion. So, um, yeah. Thoughts so, on this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, kids, especially teenagers, have a really hard time because of peer pressure. They, you know, I've, I've talked to teens and, uh, and college students, and they can't simply pull out from technology because all their friends are on tech. So it's it's really their connection to yes. their social worlds. Yes. So they they really can't pull out. Um, I, of course, I'm very concerned with um, the content that's being delivered to uh, teens. You know, some of that content is very toxic. And yes. I, I really think there needs to be um, regulations and ethicists yes. who, who really pay attention to the kind of content that's out there. Um, but for very young kids, um, there's a part of the brain that's called executive function. And this helps us um, regulate our attention. It, it helps us uh, filter out distractions and stay focused. And for young kids, it's not fully mature. Yeah, And so we're putting young kids in front of screens where, of course, they're sitting in front of the world's largest candy store. They can, you know, look up anything they want on the yeah. web. Yeah. And uh, and it's it's just not good practice for kids whose whose executive function is is not uh mature enough yeah. to expose them to this. So I, I'm very much in favor of limiting screen time for kids. 
And I think it's so important, extremely important for kids to interact with other people in person and not just mm-hmm. online because yes. you you learn from emotional cues and social cues. That's how we learn about interaction. Yes. And when when kids are texting, the the kinds of social cues that come through are so limited. They're so minimal hmm. that, you know, I, I'm afraid that this is interfering with how kids are learning about hmm. conversation, how to get into a deep conversation. So, uh, and also, um, I worry about kids being too sedentary in front of screens, and I worry about them losing this sense of um, proprioception, which is how the body moves through space. And when you're outside and you're playing and you're running and doing sports or just hanging out with your friends outside, you you get a better sense about your your body in real world space. But when we're in front of our screens, our world is a two-dimensional space. So I I, I worry about that too. Yeah. So limit it as much as we, we can with the appreciation that you said with teenagers specifically, that that is the norm of their their time of the way that they unfortunately that they do connect when they're not in school, let's say, or at, in person at some sort of an activity. Yeah. Well, what what advice can you leave the women listening? I think of like a lot of moms who might be caring for elderly parents and then they got the little ones. We just got a puppy. And so I know he's a distraction. Like I'll be focused and I'll hear like he wants to play or he needs to be fed. And so we've got all these distractions. And I think our mental capacity is not just focused on what we need to do, but on everyone as the matriarchs of our home, right? And taking care of everything. Any advice yeah. specifically um, for, I don't know, best practices? Give us like top two or three like that we can implement today, that we can walk away yeah. with today. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I would say that if if we're interrupted by children or aging parents, that's that's not a bad thing, right? It's it's yes. very important to give them our attention. Mm. It's I'm I'm more concerned about being interrupted by an email notification or text time or interrupted by ourselves to to look at social media or news. Um so there there are things that that I practice that have really helped me. Um so during the pandemic I took a course in mindfulness, mindfulness-based stress reduction. And I, I'm sure a lot of the listeners uh, are familiar with this. And it occurred to me that I could take some of those ideas from mindfulness and I can apply them to my, when, when I use my uh, devices. And so I use this idea that I call meta-awareness, practicing meta-awareness, which means being aware of what I'm doing as it's unfolding, right? So in the same way that mindfulness teaches you to stay in the present, when I'm on my device, you know, keeps me focused on the present. And when I have an urge to switch screens, when I have an urge to go to social media, I probe myself. And I've learned to probe myself and to ask myself and to reflect, why do I need to switch? Why Why do I have to, you know, check news right now. <laughs> it's it's usually because I'm bored or I'm procrastinating. Mm. But once I recognize that, right, I can do something about it. So the, the key thing is to take these unconscious actions that we do and to raise them to a conscious awareness. So, you know, picking up our, our phones is an unconscious action. And we have to become more conscious and then we can be intentional and then we can get a, a grip on ourselves and say, I don't need to look at my phone right now. Yes. Right. Or if I'm bored, what do I need to do to get this done? Right. Uh, so another kind of practice is what I call forethought. And that means imagining how our current actions will impact ourselves later in the day. Yes. And I think the the best time frame is in the evening. And so if I have a deadline, but I'm really tempted to just go on social media because it's fun, <laughs> right? I I imagine what my day, what what is it going to be like at 7 p.m. or at 10 p.m.? And I create this visualization. I, I see myself on my couch. 
uh, maybe drinking a glass of wine, relaxing, watching my favorite show. Uh, and that's enough to keep me back on track, right? I want to feel rewarded. I want to feel like, wow, I've accomplished what I set out to do. And that imagining my future self in that position of feeling rewarded and fulfilled is enough to motivate me to stay on track. I love that. I love that. You can get the dopamine, is it, or serotonin hit from that instead of likes on your post or something like that. You're, yeah. I love that so much. Um, Gloria, I'm curious about the role of goal setting as it relates to attention span and all of that. Could you speak to this a bit? Yeah, goals are extremely important. So attention is goal-directed. So depending on what our goal is, that's where we focus our attention. So if our goal is to finish this report, that's where we pay our attention. When our goals slip and suddenly our goal becomes, you know, I want to check social media, then that's where our attention goes. So it's so important to keep goals in mind. I, I did a study with colleagues at Microsoft Research, and we had a very simple conversational agent, a conversational bot that asked people two questions at the beginning of the day. Number one, uh, how, how what, to, what do you want to accomplish today? What task do you want to accomplish? The second question is, how do you want to feel today? So we had a task goal and an emotional goal. Mm -hmm. And it was successful for pe keeping people on track but we also discovered it didn't last very long. And that's because goals are dynamic. We have to constantly remind ourselves of our goals. We can't just do it once in the morning and forget about it. So we have to keep it, keep these, um, the thinking about goals very active in our minds. How do we do it? You know, write it on a post it note, jot it down. Uh, when you take a break, use it as an opportunity to remind you of your goals. But the second thing is to have an emotional goal as well. Mm. How do I want to end my day? What kind of emotion do I want to experience? Mm. And, you know, it should be that we want to feel positive or we want to feel happy. We want to feel rewarded. And having that as a goal uh, helps and en enhance our attention, right? It, it helps keep us on our task goal as well. I love it. It directs our, our intention. Yes. Right. And keeps yes. us on task so that we're less likely maybe to pick up that phone and aimlessly scroll. Yes. Perfect. Um, is there anything I didn't ask you? I know we covered a lot today that you want to make sure you leave the women listening with, you know, yeah. based on your research, please. I So a, a couple of things. So I one of the main points that I'm I'm trying to convey is I'd like us to reframe the conversation around how we use our devices instead of using them to maximize our productivity and, and packing in as much as we can in the day. I want us to think about how we can achieve well-being, get our work done, but maintain our well-being. We want to end our day in feeling positive because there's a there's a psychological theory, it's called the broaden and build theory, that says that when people feel positive, they can do more. We have a wider set of actions that we can take. We have a better choice of things we can do. We can generate more ideas. Um, if we're positive, we will be productive along the way. But let's put the well-being first, mm. first and foremost, and the productivity will happen. And Related to that is this idea, again, going back to instead of just packing our day in with as much as possible, because we have this need, you know, we're we're driven by our culture to be as so-called productive as possible. Yes. Let's let's think about designing our day in such a way to achieve this well-being. And designing our day means intentionally thinking about those times in the day when we can pull back and restore our attentional resources, um, there's a Japanese expression called yohaku no bi, which refers to the beauty of empty space. Mm. And what this means is that let's give importance to time during the day when we can pull back, we can 
contemplate, meditate, go outside, take a walk, or even do some kind of road activity. But whatever we do to replenish ourselves is as important as the actual work we're doing. And so I, I want us to break away from this culture of packing in, let's do, you know, 11 to 12, we're doing this task, 12 to 1, this meeting, 1 to 2, this meeting, no transition between. I want us to think about intentionally designing in periods of breaks so that we can replenish, so that when we end our day, we're, we're not exhausted, we feel positive, because there are carryover effects. The stress we end our day with is the stress we bring home at night. And yes. let's not do that. That's it's not good for our home life, and it, it's not good for for us experiencing chronic stress like that. Beautiful, beautiful place to end, and a nice thing to like. This is what we'll, we're going to walk away with as we're um, listening to this interview. Where do you like people to find you online? Where is a great place to have them connect, learn more about you, your book? Yeah, so you could go to my website, which is www.gloriamark. Mm -hmm. com. So it's all one word, Gloria Mark. You can learn more about the book. You can learn more about me. You can sign up for my newsletter. Um, so uh, yeah, that that would be a good place to start. I'm. You can find me on Twitter, Gloria Mark uh, underscore PhD. You can find me on LinkedIn. I, I love to talk with people. I'd love to hear about people's experiences. So, you know, I'm I'm pretty open to having people contact me. Oh, thank you so much. Well, all of the show notes for today will be over at thegoodlifecoach.com with all of the resources uh, linked to Dr. Mark's book and her website and everything that you just referenced. Thank you for teaching us about our attention span, why it's diminishing and how we can take control and focus on our well-being versus productivity. So thank you so much for today. So appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you gained some new information or inspiration for your life. That is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself. So if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can do that right now on your phone. And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now. Bye.